So uh, to mark uh, today, which is Yom HaShoah, some of you may have attended uh, other events on Zoom already to mark uh, the day, but uh, JFS is very pleased to present a uh, talk and presentation by Holocaust studies teacher, scholar, and author, Dr. Rosalind F. Schindler, uh, which she is calling Revision of a Life, Reflections and Affirmations of Hope. And she'll talk among other things about her memoir, which is titled Revision of a Life, My Mother's Holocaust Story, which chronicles the survivor story of her late mother, Goldie Apt. And of course, Goldie was also my grandmother and uh, no secret, uh, uh, Dr. Schindler, uh, Rosalind is my mother. Some of you may know her already, uh, but uh, in any case, we're really pleased to have her here. And after her presentation, uh, we'll also have an informal Q&A and conversation. So uh, whenever you're ready, uh, my dear mom, uh, you may proceed. I okay. am happy to proceed. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Neil. I'm delighted to be here today with all of you. Um, I am the only child of Holocaust survivors born just after World War II ended. I grew up in the Bronx in New York, learning about the Holocaust from my German parents, especially from my mother, and I've carried these memories with me all my life. I spoke German before I spoke English because my parents thought it wise that I speak two languages. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, however, speaking German was neither admired nor popular, and my classmates made fun of my German accent in my English. In addition, German Jewish refugees and their families were often shunned. I was considered the other. I had very few friends as making friends as the child of survivors was difficult because there was a fear of the unknown among children my age. My career path became clear during my college years. I earned a PhD in Germanic languages and literatures, and I taught German Holocaust studies and other interdisciplinary academic areas for 42 years at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Newly retired almost four years ago, I have had time to reflect on my chosen career path, which has always focused on my experiences as the daughter of Holocaust survivors. My mother was in a forced labor camp, Spazin, in Western Poland for many months after Kristallnacht in 1938. She lost two brothers and her mother, as well as other loved ones in the Warsaw Ghetto and in Auschwitz. My father suffered the indignities and persecution of Jews that occurred after 1933, until he was driven out of his homeland in late 1938 after Kristallnacht. He lost his mother and other relatives in Auschwitz. While my parents and their remaining relatives had to revise the earlier version of their lives, they affirmed life and hope, despite having experienced the horrors and devastation of the Holocaust. And those anchors of life and hope have been my anchors as well. The Holocaust course that I taught at Wayne State University was entitled Understanding the Holocaust One Life at a Time. It was a memoir-based course as I had become more and more involved with the memoir as an effective way to unsilence Holocaust survivors, many of whom did not initially want to speak about their horrific ordeals, if at all. While delving into the genre of the memoir, I was inspired to write the memoir that I always knew that I would write. I entitled it Revision of a Life, my mother's Holocaust story. The memoir follows in the tradition of many other Holocaust memoir writers and was written to contribute my mother's unique story to the canon. I echo Anka Vlasopoulos in her 2000 memoir, No Return Address, a memoir of displacement. Quote, my most deeply felt impulse to write has been to keep alive my mother's spirit, indomitable through ill chance, bleak history, and peregrinations that would have crushed or maimed a lesser being, unquote. And Irene Retty, in the oral history of Thea Felix Eden, a 1995 memoir of a woman who experienced the same forced labor camp that my mother did, expresses a critical insight. Quote, for those of us who were not there, 
who seek to somehow comprehend the events of the Holocaust. Each of these stories becomes a vital link in understanding a kaleidoscope of atrocity, unquote. It is about Zahor, remember, especially on this Yom HaShoah. As Elie Wiesel eloquently states in his preface tonight, for the dead and the living, we must bear witness. There is response in responsibility. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time, unquote. It is finally about tribute, renewal, and encouraging survivors their children and their grandchildren to unsilence the silence, to connect the generations with memory and with love. It is within this context that I wrote the memoir about my mother. I will now read some of those pages. It is Jewish tradition to dedicate learning to loved ones. And so I dedicate this presentation to my mother, Goldie Seidner Apt, to my father, Herbert Apt, and to my husband, Marvin Schindler, all of blessed memory. I also dedicate this presentation to my son, Neil, who inspired this work, who was his Oma's pride and joy, and whose 1998 poem begins this journey. It's the epigraph to the memoir, Kaddish. A welling up of voices, sorrowed, pious, and heavy with deference, these are the dizzying heights of mourning, of seeking out the unanswerable questions and answering them once more. This is how he would have us weep, how the order of things must be, how lives at the end are marked by narrow grooves worn into the rock of ages. Raised on the odor of old pine pews, the child finds his place in the holy ark his lullabies, the swelling hymns, and distant, hollow voices of the dead. From the second chapter, called Connecting the Generations, the epigraph is, connections are made slowly. You cannot always tell by looking at what is happening, by Marge Piercy. My mother shared her experiences with me with our family, with close friends, actually with anyone who would listen. She believed that the young people needed to know. She needed and wanted to leave her story for posterity and collective memory. And so it is appropriate to begin with my mother's words at age 90, her words. Someday you will tell my story. You will write a book. If I could be an author, I would do it myself. I had a big family in Hamburg. I remember my parents, my brothers, all gone long ago. I'm from the Holocaust, from the whole family, the kids, and I'm the only one. They didn't have to die, but Hitler wanted them to die. I had a beautiful life, and then it all changed when Hitler came to power. He wanted me to die too, but I lived, I still live in my high age, and my family is with me every day. From chapter four, the title um, includes my mother's words. Quote, what's going on here in Germany? What do they do with people they don't like? Unquote. And the epigraph for that chapter is by a dear late friend, Ingeborg Hecht, also a memoirist. We did not emerge unscathed. My mother's turn to leave Schwazin came in the fall of 1939. One of the Polish security officers thought that my mother was Christian because she had green eyes and held in her arms a picture of her father, who had happened looked like Paul von Hindenburg, the exceedingly popular president of Germany, who appointed Hitler chancellor in 1933. The guard felt sympathetic towards her, even friendly. When questioned, she did not deny that she was Jewish. He made arrangements for her to leave anyway, but she would not do so without her mother. He allowed it, and my mother and grandmother returned to their apartment in Hamburg, as did her brothers, Bernhard and Hermann, 
and also Hermann's wife, Eva, soon thereafter. From chapter five, Safe Haven. The epigraph is by Giuseppe Ungaretti. Never have I been so attached to life. After returning to Hamburg, my mother was urged by her mother and Bernhard to leave Germany. Her mother told her, excuse me, her brother told her that he would not leave, that he would take care of their mother. They pleaded with her to leave, knowing what her departure would mean to them, but especially knowing what it would mean to her. Fortunately, she heeded her brother's advice and the wise words of her mother, geh mein Kind, geh zur Freiheit, du kannst hier nicht mehr bleiben. Go my child, go to freedom, you cannot stay here anymore. She never saw her mother or her two brothers again. These losses remained an open excruciating wound all her life. My mother spent the next many months getting her passport and visa in order and making connections to leave Germany. Her passport documents show her checking in with the police approximately once a month after she received her passport in September 1939 when World War II began. The passport also documents the visa granted by the American Consulate General in Hamburg in November 1939, her departure from Hamburg on December 29, 1939, and passage through Genoa, Italy on the way to the United States. My mother's sponsors in the United States were her brother Friedrich, the only one who had survived, and her cousin Louis Tal. She departed with a broken heart. Bernhardt lived with my grandmother until they were both deported from Germany, from Hamburg to Auschwitz sometime later, likely in 1943. In the last days of 1939, my mother, then 28, left Germany through the Italian Jewish underground with the visa that she was finally granted. She was assisted by Hyas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, an American organization dedicated to this day to helping people get from places of persecution to places of safety. My mother's place of her childhood had become a place of persecution and she was desperate for a place of safety, a safe haven. The trip by ship across the Mediterranean Sea with over 500 refugees on board was dangerous because of the mines that had to be avoided. She arrived safely in New York in late January, 1940, after a month long trip. Her brother Friedrich and her cousin Louis Tal met her at the dock. The first years were especially difficult for my mother. She accomplished more than anyone had the right to expect. Her words. But it was hard at first to get used to things in the United States. I was happy that I had such a wonderful profession. I was thrown out of Germany. I had to go to unemployment to get money. It was very hard to live there, but I am happy that I am the survivor from my family. I came to New York and lived in New York for many, many years. I worked on Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue in the garment district. I was a dressmaker. They saw that I was trained in Germany for a long time and worked there for a long time as a dressmaker and wanted to be a designer. My mother's early life as she knew it was shattered by the Holocaust. Hers was a revision of a life that had an earlier failed vision. She married and built a new family. She rejoiced in the few family members she had left as well as the extension of her family through the years. Quote, now I have a wonderful new family, a brilliant grandson, if I may say so, and a wonderful son-in-law and my daughter. She also felt blessed with Daniel, Lori, and Inga from Marvin's first marriage, whom she lovingly embraced as her grandchildren as well. My mother expressed the following to Neil in his interview of her and often to me through the years um, I should mention here that many of um, the words that I'm quoting from my mother were from an interview that Neil uh, did of her in 1994. 
My life is not exactly accomplished, but without my new family, I would not be alive anymore. My new family keeps me alive. I'm so proud of all of you, unquote. Her life was accomplished well beyond her fondest dreams in the minds and hearts of all who knew her, admired her, and loved her. I convinced her finally in 1986 to move from her apartment in Queens, New York, to one in Southfield, Michigan, five minutes from our home. It was a good decision. She was able to see Neil grow up and enjoy her family without geographical distance. It was very important for her and for me to have her close for family outings, milestone family events, holidays, and just to be within reach as she grew older. During the 18 years that she lived in Michigan, she relished every minute she had with us, and we were so fortunate to have her here. She was, after all, the on only grandparent Neil would ever know. Having grown up without any grandparents, I felt it especially important that Neil get to know his only grandmother and that my mother experience her grandson growing up. Over time, my mother acquired a wide circle of friends across the generations, and she developed a joyful and infectious zest for life. For all that she endured, she remained a woman of courage, fierce determination, and resourcefulness. She was a woman of passion and compassion, of optimism and insight, of a wonderful sense of humor, and especially a remarkable energetic spirit that belied her advancing age. She retained too a spiritual nature that consoled and uplifted her, allowing her to acknowledge each day as a beautiful gift. She is for me, a continuing role model of how to live and love life and how to age gracefully with dignity and integrity. Chapter seven, which was, is the last chapter of the memoir. I entitled it, De Let's De Gang, The Final Journey. Shema Yisrael Adonai, Adonai Echad. Listen, Israel, the eternal is our God, the eternal one alone. Each of us has a name given by God and given by our parents. Each of us has a name given by the sea and given by our death. Uh, this is from a poem by Zelda Mishkowski. My mother was a believer, a religious woman, although not a consistently observant Jew in the Orthodox sense, as she had been taught as a child. She valued all Jewish traditions, observed all the holidays, and had a fiercely strong and loving relationship with her God. Shortly before her 88th birthday, in March 1999, she had a debilitating stroke. I was with her at the precise moment it happened. She believed that the cause of it was the heavy burden she continued to carry all her life, the loss of most of her immediate family members in the Holocaust. But she knew that she would overcome this new challenge, and she did so admirably because of her strong will to recover and to live. From that point on, however, she required the attention of caregivers, both day and night. She had lost a great deal of physical strength, that loss prevented her from carrying out daily routines as she had before. This weighed heavily on her at first, since she took great pride in her independence. Fortunately, she recovered well. And in fact, uh, as Neil will remember and others may remember, um, she danced at her 90th birthday celebration. Um, so she had recovered sufficiently well to do that and was very happy to do that because she loved to dance. My mother was able to continue to enjoy life, albeit with some limitations until May, 2004, when her condition became much more serious. 
During the seven months that she was still with us, she had to be hospitalized several times before she was in the care of hospice during her final two weeks of life. She died peacefully in her own bed on December 21st, 2004 at 8.30 in the morning. She died in a circle of love with two of her caregivers present. I held her hand as she took her last breath. Prior to her death, on that cold, sunny, crisp winter morning, she had rallied a few times. Two weeks before her death, her doctors told me that she would no longer be lucid, but she was indeed very lucid. And a few days before she died, she pulled me close to her and said, I'm so sorry you have suffered so much. We looked into each other's eyes with deep understanding she was referring to the loss of my husband one and a half years before. Excuse me. I wept because of what she said, but even more because she was so lucid. The connection was powerful and lasting, the forever kind of lasting we rarely come to know in this life. I told her that I would be all right and that I was all right. It was the same thing I had said to my husband a few hours before he died on June 11th, 2003. That, and I love you, and I will always love you. It is a natural thing to say to loved ones to give them that final comfort and reassurance, the permission to let go. Yet it isn't something one rehearses. It just comes at the right time for the right reason. <clears throat> Before her death, my mother also asked me to promise her that I would visit Hamburg again and stand at her father's grave to say Kaddish once more. I told her that I would. I had taken my mother back to Hamburg um, in 1973 the first time she was back in Germany after she had uh, uh, left. And we spent days walking around her city and she showed me all the places uh, that she held dear during her childhood, many of which were still there. I told her that I would visit Hamburg again. She mouthed the words of the Shema, the first prayerful words we learn as children and the last words we speak before we die. She knew that she would die soon and she wanted to speak those words in my presence. How many victims of the Holocaust had these same words on their lips in terror and with the greatest dignity before they met their death so cruelly, so savagely. My mother, though, could speak them softly, in peace, in security, with love and a faint smile. These words could give her comfort because they tied her to her tradition, to all of Jewish history, to those who spoke the same words before her. Her father, Aaron, her mother, Rosa, her brothers, Hermann, Friedrich, and Bernard, her husband, Herbert, and countless others. Rabbi David A. Teutsch's commentary is especially poignant here. Quote, as creatures made conscious of our ultimate worth by love, we recite the Shema. We thereby enter into a partnership aimed at transforming the world and ourselves in the light of that vision of ultimate worth, unquote. We recall that it was human worth that the Nazis tried to strip from 6 million Jews and millions of others during their 12 year campaign of crimes against humanity. While they succeeded with mass murder, they never succeeded in taking away, quote, that vision of ultimate worth, unquote. This memoir is in the end about place or the many places my mother came to know and became as she moved through her life. Quote, each of us is all the places we have been 
especially the place of our childhood. This is a quotation by Farron Schumer Chapman from a memoir that she wrote about her mother. The poem, In Many Houses, by American journalist and poet Diane Cole, returns me full circle to the beginning of this memoir. And I will uh, cite the whole poem. It provides a fitting ending to this memoir and to this presentation. In many houses all at once, I see my mother and father as they are young, as they walk in. Why should my tears come to see them laughing? That they cannot see me is of no matter. I was once their dream, now they are mine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a heartfelt uh, presentation. Uh, it's a story that uh, it's always important to be reminded of, at least uh, I know in our family, but uh, I think there are aspects of it that transcend just the story of our own family, and I hope that that came across to some of those who are attending today. Um, I certainly want to encourage um, if anyone who's uh, in attendance has a question or comment, uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself. I think we can try to do that uh, and be a little less formal. So go ahead, uh, Mary or Herschel. Mary. Um, I wondered, Rosalind, first of all, thank you for sharing what you wrote and thank your mother's story. Um, did, did your mother, who was her community in New York? Did she, was, she, was she connected with other people who had um, left Germany at about the same time or did she connect with other survivors or? Yes, uh, the answer is yes. Um, we were members of an Orthodox congregation. We were not Orthodox, but uh, the congregation was composed of uh, Holocaust survivors, mostly German Holocaust survivors. And that was the community really. And the other parts of the community were uh, family members who survived, who also lived in, um, in New York. Just to add from someone who had the pleasure of knowing Goldie, she was a grandmother to our entire congregation. She represented the past and the present because she was always present. But we knew that story. We didn't know all the details till perhaps your memoir or to other things in between, but we knew enough to have the sense that she had survived when many others had not. And she felt that very strongly and felt that as a responsibility. So as a member of her congregation, Congregation Zahia in Detroit, I'd like you to know that being a grandmother to people who you are not related to is really very important because many of us don't have our own grandmothers or we've lost them or we lose them. Right. And Goldie always was there. You talked to her about dancing. I remember her dancing at that party, but she danced in life for us and with us. And that was very beautiful. Thank um, you for sharing. You're, you're very welcome. There's something that I want to add. Um, there is a, a section of the memoir that I didn't read. Uh, I didn't know, <laughs> I, I didn't time the reading, so I didn't want to, you know, over overshoot. And so uh, I had to leave some very important aspects out. Um, as you probably gathered from what I said, um, our family was very small, very small indeed. And um, I really only knew of um, one family, two families um, who had children uh, and those children were my cousins. Um, my father's brother and his wife who lived in, in New York in upper Manhattan in Washington Heights. Their son, Peter was my first cousin. And my father's first cousin, Nathan and Ruth had two sons, um, uh, Dennis uh, and, and his brother. Um, um, and uh, those were my cousins. And that's all I knew until uh, 1989 when Marvin and I moved to Huntington Woods. And uh, Marvin was a um, professor of German. Uh, he had been uh, chair of the Romance and Germanic Languages Department at Wayne State. 
And uh, he often went to a variety of meetings and so forth and, and cultural events, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, he was at one of the cultural events. Um, I can't recall exactly what it was, but um, he met someone whose last name uh, was the same as mine, apt. And um, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so um, Marvin met uh, Jeff Apt and Marvin said to him, uh, your last name is the same as my wife's maiden name. And Jeff said, oh, I think he probably said, oh. <laughs> and uh, Marvin said, um, uh, you know, I don't know whether you might be related or not. Uh, where are your people from? Um, and Jeff said, um, from Germany. And he mentioned the town in Germany, not far from Frankfurt, um, uh, called Angenroth. And that's where my father grew up. And, um, and Jeff said, you probably, you know, haven't heard of it. And Marvin said, try me. And so that, that conversation happened. And um, it was either that night or the next night. Um, I called Jeff and we talked. And I see Jeff and Mary are also here, which is delightful. Thank you. Um, and um, the reason I'm telling you the story is for several reasons, actually. Um, it was so, so meaningful to me to have um, more cousins, more family. Um, uh, and for my mother, it was especially meaningful. Uh, I remember her saying to me many times, um, we went to Seder at Mary and Jeff's home uh, with Marvin and Neil when Neil was growing up and, and their children uh, were growing up and so forth. And she would say to me, I'm just so happy that you have new family because when I'm not there anymore, you'll have family. And um, it's still a very, very emotional thing for me and uh, will always be, I guess. Um, uh, I grew up without brothers and sisters. Uh, I was an only child, as I said, and um, only children tend to um, uh, find as my, as our friend Maureen Lynn Bernard always says, chosen kin, um, uh, chosen siblings. And, uh, one of those is actually on this call too. My friend Lois, who's in South Carolina, she is most definitely my sister, uh, from another mother. <laughs> and, uh, and I have had the, um, the benefit and, um, uh, and blessing really to have uh, some very close friends through the years who are like siblings to me. And it is especially important uh, for me uh, to have Jeff and Mary as my relatives, as my family. So had to tell the story. I might've left out some details, Jeff, or I might've confused a few, but that's okay. <laughs> it's the general idea. Yeah, it's, it's quite a story. Um, right. It's, uh, it's and a, it's uh, in addition, I'll just mention this too, uh, just in passing, that um, uh, I asked Jeff for his, his dad's uh, telephone number um, because I wanted to talk with him because he was my father's cousin. <clears throat> and they knew each other, of course, very well in Germany and so forth. And uh, so um, I, I grew to know him and his wife and, and so forth you know, through the years. And that was extremely meaningful to me as well. And um, I still have a family tree that uh, Arthur um, gave me uh, of, of the apt family. Um, and that's, that's really important, that side of the family. Yes. All right, other, other comments or questions? Hmm. Um, well, I, I was curious as to looking back um, years after you wrote the memoir, um, in what ways for you was, was writing a personal family Holocaust story different from how you taught or presented other 
families, other people's stories, and in what ways were there similarities? It's a really, really good question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, when I taught my Holocaust class, um, I included memoirs by authors like Ingeborg Hecht, Hilde Burger, Lotte Pepke, and others, um, uh, German women, women primarily, um, who uh, had uh, been in hiding or were otherwise um, protected during the Holocaust and chose to stay in Germany uh, after the Holocaust. And they wrote memoirs, um, some usually 40, um, 40 plus years after the fact. And when I taught the course, I always included those. And I, um, I wrote my, the memoir uh, about my mother um, in, in 2007, although I, didn't, I ended up self-publishing it in 2009. That's an interesting story by itself. But um, uh, the memoirs about others um, were discussed in class uh, as, as um, important pieces of the kaleidoscope of stories that are important uh, for people to know about. Um, and when we discussed the memoir that I wrote about my mother, it obviously was extremely personal. Um, uh, I would say that um, uh, many, of the, uh, many of the aspects of the other memoirs um, were, were very personal to me because I knew the authors. That's, that's part of it. Um, students um, approached the other memoirs as, um, as, as they should, as, um, as aspects of, of, uh, of the course that, I, that uh, they were taking, I was teaching, um, and um, in, uh, appreciated, um, appreciated the different kinds of stories that, that related there. When it came time to discuss the memoir about my mother, um, they they read it uh, with great interest and and came forth with with all kinds of questions, um, some of a very personal nature and so forth, uh, about my own relationship uh, to my mother, my relationship to writing the memoir and so forth. How did I write it, etc. How difficult was it, and so forth and so on. I'm not sure if I answered your question fully, but. Um, I, you know, mostly I was just curious because you've spent so many years teaching and writing about other people's stories, whether there were aspects of that that were particularly applicable when it came time to write your own yeah. family story or whether um, there were things that didn't, that, that were significantly different in terms of how you wanted to convey uh, your own family story, our family story. But it, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> that may be maybe a little more uh, complicated than I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I can I can just tell you that uh, I wrote I was on sabbatical leave um, in uh, the winter semester uh, 2007 and I wrote the memoir during that semester. Um, and I. Um, often had to stop because I was crying a lot, <laughs> which I'm sure you can imagine. Um, and having witnessed the presentation here today, it's very difficult for me to read and to talk about it without great emotion because it's simply there. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is, um, it was a very different experience. It was a very emotional experience. It was um, trying to piece together um, my history, my father's history, my mother's history, uh, um, your history to an extent, yes, of course. Um, and um, so uh, in, in that way, it was, it was very different. It was very different. The other memoirs, by the way, were also very personal. I mean, they, they were personal from the perspective of the of the the authors 
of course. And since I knew the authors, I could I could relate in in um, in a way that probably someone else teaching those memoirs couldn't. I mean, that was that was another important aspect. Um, the reason that I self-published it in the end in 2009, I tried for two years, almost two years, to get it published. It's a little over 100 pages. And the comments that I got back from, you know, from a variety of publishers was that it was too short and could I double its length? Uh, and my answer was no. Um, I wrote what I wrote and that's the way it's going to stay. Um, <clears throat> and the other uh, comments that I got were unfortunate, and I responded to all of them, were that um, some of the publishers weren't responding, weren't publishing uh, Holocaust memoirs anymore, uh, because there are, quote unquote, enough of them out there. And of course, there are never enough of them out there, because, uh, you know, until there are 6 million of them out there, which there aren't. Um, and of course, that's not possible. So it's, it's, up to, it's up to the survivors or the children of the survi survivors or, or, you know, the third generation, your generation, to, to write about this experience so that it, it remains present um, in, 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 the, in the lives of, of not only Jews, but all people um, as a, uh, a horrific part of history. Uh, that they need to know about uh, in detail, but not only in detail with regard to the numbing details, uh, the numbing statistics and, and all of that, but in terms of the individual stories, because it's really only through the individual stories that you, you really get a sense of, um, of, of how people lived through the experience or didn't. Right, and that's that's the emotional access point for an outside observer uh, or learner, right, to be able to uh, understand and be engaged with specific stories. That's just how, I guess, our minds and hearts work. So, I mean, I think that's yes, yeah, that underpins your philosophy of of one life at a time. Yes, yes, um, sure. Okay, well, I. You know, I, oh, go ahead, uh, Harriet. Just on the other hand, if you were to add, as you look back on it, just one more story, is there just one that you might want to add that you're sorry you don't have in those 100 pages? I don't want you to write another 100 pages, but I'm just looking perhaps for something that as you look back on it now, uh, that you're sorry you left out. Just add that little extra story for us. I, I can tell you uh, in just very, very briefly that, <clears throat> I had occasion to find out about uh, more information related to my paternal grandparents. And Jeff was actually responsible for that, putting me in contact with someone in Germany um, who has written a lot about uh, Angenroth, about the Jews in Angenroth. And I have actually thought about uh, revising the memoir to include that in the first chapter. The first chapter is about is solely about my father. I mean. My mother is included too, of course, but um, uh, uh, but it's it's a tribute to my father. So I would include it in that chapter. So that's what I would do. Um, I think I also saw Doris. Did you have a hand up? Oh yes. Um, is my ah. son... <laughs> Jeff is um, ah. <laughs> showing you a picture of my father. I think it's from 1929. Is that right? Something along those lines. Oh, uh, my father oh, in in his car. Oh, yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, thank that's you. Great. Thanks. Yeah, Dr. Schindler, thank you for sharing your memoir. And also, how old were you when your mom talked with you about the, her experience? And um, in high school, do you think the best way to explain the Holocaust to uh, teenagers is through uh, personal stories? Yes. Okay. So um, I would say that I started learning about um, the Holocaust through my parents and, and other relatives when I was relatively young. I was probably seven, eight, nine years old when you know, I first was really conscious of all of that. And my mother um, would you know, tell me lots of stories through the years. 
And then um, as part of a project, I mentioned this earlier, uh, that Neil was engaged in in 1994, um, he interviewed my mother and uh, there's an audio tape which was then transcribed and the quotations uh, uh, from my mother, um, not all of them, but um, many of them are from that interview that Neil did. So I'm eternally grateful, of course, to Neil. Uh, okay, I think now I'm not muted anymore. Somehow I got muted by accident. Anyway. Um, there are books um, for children um, about the Holocaust uh, for children who are as young as five or six, um, certainly seven. Um, and um, they, uh, they really approach the process not from the perspective of murder, per se, mm -hmm. but of bullying, the oh. aspect of bullying enters in very strongly uh, when one child bullies another child, you know, in the playground uh, for no reason at all, just because the child is the child, no, no reason. So those, those kinds of uh, dynamics um, help children to understand uh, that there are people in the world who um, are not kind to other people, uh, not for any specific reason, but just because they are who they are, which is, I mean, leads up to uh, a better discussion, a more robust discussion, a complete discussion of the Holocaust. Um, <laughs> most, most, um, uh, most, um, uh, high schools uh, that I'm familiar with in this area um, include uh, units on the Holocaust. Um, yes. And that's probably true nationwide, not necessarily in every city or, you know, in every school system and so forth. But that's certainly true. I participated some years ago um, uh, at the Holocaust Memorial Center uh, here in, in uh, Farmington Hills, um, which is actually the first Holocaust museum in the country, was the first one in the country. Uh, I participated in a, um, in a week long seminar. I um, uh, did a presentation uh, on one of the days um, focusing on teaching about the Holocaust, teaching uh, high school students uh, about the Holocaust and also teaching the Holocaust from an interdisciplinary perspective. Um, I um, uh, taught in an interdisciplinary studies program for adult learners for 34 years at Wayne State, uh, and then taught, in a, taught German and continued to teach Holocaust studies for the remainder of my 42 years there. Um, in any event, uh, I, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Did yeah. I? Oh, good. Yes, thank you. Oh, good. Um, it's hard not to go off on tangents, so. That's great. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, unless there are any other comments or questions folks have, I think we'll probably uh, draw uh, this event to a close. But I I definitely want to thank uh, my, my mom for um, uh, sharing the, the story and also being so honest about the emotions that, uh, that lie behind it still. Um, and uh, certainly if, if anyone is inclined, I, I imagine uh, that you would be all right with folks getting in contact with you. Uh, um, absolutely. Uh, and <clears throat> um, I, I would say this also, I, um, I'll, I'll mention this just you know at the end. Um, I, I mentioned that I self-published it uh, with the assistance of um, a woman who used to be a member of our congregation, Congregation Tachia, but now she's in upstate New York, and she's a wonderful artist. Um, she uh, carried out my vision of the cover, uh, which included lots of pictures. Um, all of the pictures, all of the photos in the memoir um, are mine, they were my mother's, uh, and even from the forced labor camp, she had uh, photos from there. And there are many other photos of her family and so forth. And 
I uh, wanted her to create um, create the cover, um, including uh, what are called Stolpersteine. I don't know whether all of you know what those are. Um, they are um, in many places in Europe, certainly many places in Germany, um, in front of homes uh, where someone um, someone was deported, uh, say to Auschwitz, uh, family members uh, can uh, place a, a literally a stone there. Uh, it's usually in gold uh, with the name of the person, birth date, um, deportation date, and and so forth, um, as a kind of memorial. Because we know that um, that we don't have uh, resting places for uh, those who perished in who were murdered in in concentration camps and so forth, um, and. The, uh, the whole aspect of Stoppersteine became actually quite controversial at first because um, many people felt that, um, that people would be walking over those stones and sort of standing on them and so forth and not, not honoring them. But um, the, the whole point of them uh, is to make people pause and, and look and see uh, who lived there and what happened. Um, so, um, and what, what does Stolpersteine mean in English for those? Um, stumbling stones, literally stones that you stumble over. Yeah, which I mean, talk about a powerful yes. and tangible way in which the yes. history is made to, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to say intrude upon, but become uh, evident to people as they're just going uh -huh. about their daily business. Right. Right. So um, all that to say that um, when I self-published the memoir, um, I first I ordered 100 copies. I gave them all away to friends and family uh, and students. And then I ended up ordering another 100 copies um, and gave them away to students. I've given them all away except for three. I'm saving one uh, for my grandson uh, when he's old enough and uh, one uh, for my great grandson, and then one I'm keeping uh, for the purpose of, I only have three left, and one for the purpose of doing presentations, which I've, I've done a lot. But I do have a PDF of the memoir, and if anyone is interested in reading it, I would be very happy to send you the PDF. That's so very I kind. I just wanted, wanted you to know that in the event you wanted to read some of it or just look at it or whatever. Um, and uh, if you let Neil know, um, uh, you know, I can, I can say, I'll send it to him and then he can send it on to you or you can contact me directly. Of course, he has my contact information. <laughs> Very good. Yes, certainly be in touch with me if you'd like to read the memoir. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much again for your time today and um, for your work in, in chronicling such an important story. Uh, and, and for your many decades of work in uh, presenting others and, and teaching the Holocaust. So thank you. And I want to thank you for inviting me and also everyone for uh, attending today and for your, for your um, kind attention. Thank you so much. And take good care, everyone. Everyone stay safe. And you. We're very grateful. Thank you. All right. Good to see everyone today. Take care. Be well. Be well.